Meet Scott Gordon. Scott is a Mormon apologist and president of the Foundation for Apologetic Information and Research, also known as FAIR. In a recent presentation at Utah Valley University, Scott talked about the world of Mormon apologetics and criticized those who claim that the Mormon Church hides or distorts information about its early leaders in history. Scott addressed the issues of Joseph Smith's polygamy and the translation method of the Book of Mormon. Another common tactic is to claim the church is hiding the information. Two quick examples. Many are upset when they learn that Joseph Smith practiced plural marriage, or they learn that Joseph Smith may have used a hat and a seer stone while translating the Book of Mormon. You think? Discovering that the translation method of the Book of Mormon was for Joseph Smith to place his seer stone into a hat, bury his face into the hat, gaze into his magical rock, and dictate the text to a scribe was quite a shock to me. Growing up in the church and through its seminary and institute systems, I was always taught that Joseph Smith translated the characters on the golden plates to produce the Book of Mormon. The church has published numerous paintings of Joseph Smith looking directly at the golden plates, running his fingers over the engravings while dictating to a scribe. So for some reason, when a member finds out about the rock and a hat method, it upsets them. Just about every former believing member I have had the good fortune to talk to has told me that this was an issue for them. While many more members, maybe even most, are aware that Joseph Smith introduced the practice of polygamy, very few of them know any of the details of how he practiced the principle. For instance, LDS historians have documented that Joseph Smith married at least 33 plural wives, most of whom were kept a secret from his first wife, Emma. Eleven of these women were already married, and nine of them were teenagers, with two of them being only 14 years old. In my experience, it is the discovery of these details that upsets people. The typical claim is the church has been hiding this, or has been dishonest about it. Scott is implying that this criticism is false, and that the church has been open and honest about these issues. Well, if this were true, then why would all of these members encountering this information be getting upset? Here's a short list of where you can read about Joseph Smith's uh, marriages. You are right, Scott. That is a short list. What do we have? Six references in 39 years? That is once every six and a half years, just long enough for that information to fall down the old memory hole. So let's see just how open and honest the LDS Church is being about these issues, and check out Scott's list. Of course, we have a lesson manual in 2007. All right, this source says, this book also does not discuss plural marriage. Hold, hold, hold on a minute, Scott. This is your reference? Your first reference? You are using a passage that states that plural marriage is not supposed to be discussed as evidence that the church is being open and honest about the subject? Really? Well, this source does go on to say that the doctrine of plural marriage was revealed to Joseph in 1831. It does not say whether or not Joseph Smith actually married any extra wives or performed any plural marriages. It only lets the reader know that a number of plural marriages happened to be performed by someone during his lifetime. And signed to 1992. Well, this article does state that Emma was deeply hurt when Joseph told her they were going to have to live the law of plural marriage. It does not actually say whether they entered into polygamy before Joseph died. We cannot learn anything about Joseph Smith's plural marriages from this source, only that he hurt his wife's feelings. Ensign 1989. While this reference does tell us that Joseph taught the Knights the doctrine, there's that word again, doctrine, of plural marriage, it tells us nothing about Joseph Smith's plural wives. Scott, did you bother to read any of these articles? Ensign 1978. Finally, here we go. This source does contain a single detail about Joseph's polygamy, the name of a wife. Of course, it fails to mention she was 17 and Joseph was 36 when they got hitched. Several weeks after they were wed, Joseph wrote a letter to Sarah Ann while he was in hiding from the law on the outskirts of Nauvoo. He wrote, My feelings are so strong for you since what has passed lately between us. It seems as if I could not long live this way. I know it is the will of God that you should comfort me now in this time of affliction. The only thing to be careful of is to find out when Emma comes. Then you cannot be safe. But when she is not here, there is the most perfect safety. Burn this letter <laughs> as soon as you read it. Keep all locked up in your breasts. You will pardon me for my earnestness on this subject when you consider how lonesome I must be. Oh, he was lonely. I think Emma won't come tonight. 
If she don't, don't fail to come tonight. I wonder why this letter didn't make the article. Seems evident to me that Joseph was keeping this relationship, like he did with most of them, a secret from his first wife, Emma. Secret teen brides? Who knew? Well, not me. Inside 1977. Again, this source does not say that Joseph practiced polygamy, just that the practice was started during his lifetime by somebody. Scott, why do you keep using sources that do not support your claim? One thing this article does recognize is that the practice was kept a secret, albeit a poorly kept one, until it was publicly announced by Brigham Young in 1852. At that time, there was a section in the Mormon scripture, the Doctrine and Covenants, that denied the practice of polygamy and stated that monogamy was the law of the church. That section remained in the LDS canon for a couple of more decades after this announcement. This section was used by leaders of the church, some of whom were already polygamists, to deny that the Mormons were practicing polygamy when, in, when attempting to gain new converts. It was also illegal in the territory. This meant that Young and everyone else practicing the principle were breaking the law and thus violating their own Articles of Faith. New Era 1973. Nothing is said at all about Joseph Smith practicing plural marriage in this passage. Scott is really reaching for references at this point. However, it is interesting to note that Joseph claims to have gotten these authoritative keys to perform celestial and plural marriage from an angelic Noah. This supposedly happened in the Kirtland Temple on April 3rd, 1836. Joseph's first documented plural wife was the 16-year-old Fanny Alger in 1833. The first article in Scott's list stated that Joseph received the revelation to start practicing plural marriage as early as 1831. So why would God instruct and allow Joseph to practice polygamy many years before giving him the authority to do so? And of course there's always the DNC section 132 that talks about plural marriage. While this section does talk about polygamy, when, is it, when it is justified, when it is adultery, and how any wife who objects to her husband taking on more plural wives will be destroyed by God, nice, it does not state that Joseph had entered into any polygamous marriages or give any details on how it was being lived. In the church's Sunday school manual that teaches about this section, plural marriage is not covered. The teacher is explicitly instructed at the end of the lesson that this subject should not be the focus of the lesson and is given a couple of quotes they can use to deflect and dismiss any questions that may arise in class. So upon review, we see that only one of the seven sources that Scott provided contain any specific information about how Joseph Smith practiced the doctrine of polygamy. While the church hints at polygamy here and there, it is not something that can be openly discussed at church or in the church materials. The church manuals specifically state that the subject is to be avoided and not discussed. Is it any wonder then why members, when they learn about the details of Joseph Smith's polygamy, the young teen brides, the polyandry, are disturbed by this information? What do you expect, Scott? As far as translation with a stone in the hat. Okay, so here we have five references in 38 years or one every seven and a half years. Forgive me, Scott, if I'm still not impressed by that. But in order to be fair, let's see if any of these references are any better than the previous set of obfuscation. Ensign 1997. This article does mention a seer stone and something called a Urim and Thummim. However, it does not say anything about how they were used or mention anything about a hat. Now, if I recall correctly, the Urim and Thummim was used to produce the first 116 pages that Martin Harris lost. As a result of losing those pages, the golden plates and the Urim and Thummim were taken from Joseph Smith by the custodial angel. When the translation process started back up again, Joseph started using the seer stone he had previously found while digging a well. This was the same magic rock he had used while employed to find buried treasure in the 1820s, of which they never found any. Since the Book of Mormon we have was not translated by the use of the Urim and Thummim, any reference to these crystal stones set in a bow and attached to a breastplate is not applicable. Ensign 1993 and... Okay, this is a good source. Apostle Nelson quotes David Whitmer, who describes exactly how the translation process went down. Score one for the openness of the church. Ensign 1998. While this source mentions the Urim and Thummim, it does not mention the seer stone or a hat. 
The reader could not have learned anything about the translation process that produced our Book of Mormon from this article. Ensign 1997. Okay, this is another good source. But notice it is the same David Whitmer quote that was in Elder Nelson's article that we examined earlier. At least we know the church considers Whitmer's account as valid. So why do they continue to teach and publish pictures of Joseph translating the characters on the golden plates when the church knows that's not how it happened? Why are they teaching something that's contrary to the historical record? And The Friend, 1974, that talks about that. This article does mention that Joseph was reading the text that would appear on the surface of his seer stone, but it says nothing about a hat. It is interesting that Scott's sources are evidence of a tight translation of the Book of Mormon. This means it wasn't just the ideas, but the exact words and grammar that were of divine origin and shown to Joseph Smith. All he had to do was read the words as they appeared. It makes one wonder why a book that was created in such a way would require so many edits. If this really was how the text was produced, then there shouldn't have been any errors in what Mormons consider to be the most correct book on, the most correct book on earth. So we see that only two out of the five sources that Scott provides give the reader any indication that the translation process of the Book of Mormon consisted of Joseph Smith gazing at his magical seer stone which was placed inside of a hat. Once again, most of Gordon's references do not support his claim. It seems to me that he is really stretching to find anything that will support his position that the church is being open and honest with its membership. Anything will do, as long as it is kind of in the ballpark, so he can put that reference in a list. He can then show that list to people, without discussing anything in particular, and say, See, the church does publish articles about this stuff. If you didn't know about it, you were not paying attention, you were not studying properly, or you were just reading too much anti-Mormon material. The church is not the problem, it is you. I have noticed this is a common tactic of the LDS apologist. Blame the person asking the question or having doubts. It is always their fault. The church is blameless. These apologists are not interested in what is true, only in finding some way, any way, to make the pieces fit so that the church can be protected. This is why Scott had to use such flimsy examples. They are all he had. But hey, why should you listen to me? I am one of those untrustworthy anti-Mormon guys, right? Okay, let's go to the official church website, josephsmith.net and see exactly how open and honest the church is about these issues. Okay, here we are. Let's do a search for polygamy. Mm, zero hits. Uh, let's, let's try plural marriage. Uh, zero hits again. Let's look at Emma Smith. Wow, 73. Well, maybe it's time to talk about his wives. Let's look for wife number two, Fanny Alger. Uh, oh, zero hits again. What about the wife who Scott referenced earlier, Sarah Ann? Oh, still zero. So, just how open and honest is the church being about Joseph Smith's polygamy, Scott? Just to be fair, let's try a uh, seer stone hat. Mm, zero hits. Alright, let's just try seer stone. Uh, well, it looks like there is one link that references DNC 28. In that section of the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph tells Hiram Page that the revelations he was getting through his stone, hey, more people had stones, are not coming from God, but they're coming from Satan. It says nothing about the Book of Mormon translation process, so still nothing. All right, let's search for translating golden plates. There we go, 14 hits. All right, let's try translating Book of Mormon. Whoa, 96 hits. So the website is all set up to tell people about the translation process of the golden plates into the Book of Mormon without any mention of the seer stone or a hat. Scott. Why is the church, which you are claiming is being honest and open about these issues, not telling people about the Book of Mormon translation process on their website? Too many members believe that we teach history in Sunday school classes. That is not what we do. We use examples from history to teach gospel principles. You can learn about history from a book about history, not from a church lesson manual. Well. It's too bad that the writers of the Sunday School Manual disagree with you, Scott. The introduction to the Doctrine and Covenants and Church History Manual says, as you study the Doctrine and Covenants and Church History, and later it says, this study guide has been prepared to help you study the Doctrine and Covenants and Church History. So, 
the Sunday School Manual that teaches church history says that we are supposed to use it to study church history. Are historical examples used to teach principles? Of course they are. Is that mutually exclusive with learning about church history? Not at all! So why would Scott take such a strong position against what the church is claiming to do with its curriculum? Well, when creating the curriculum for instruction manuals for the church, the leaders have established a policy that only the faith-promoting stories, doctrines, and historical events are to be mentioned. Nothing that might reflect poorly on the church or its leaders is to be included. In his instruction to church education teachers, Elder Packer gives a warning to those who do not edit their writings and teachings in a faith-promoting way. Those who publicly talk or write about advanced history and the difficult doctrines may face discipline and have in fact been excommunicated. As a result, there is a fear to write or teach about the meatier and difficult aspects of the church. As a result of that, the average member has only been taught the correlated and heavily edited version of church history and doctrine. Scott knows this and is trying to defend the gigantic holes in the history being taught to the membership by stating that members are wrong to expect the church to teach them history in the church history course. Once again, it's always the members who are at fault. The church is blameless. But sometimes members happen to run into information about the church that is contrary to what they have been taught. They may encounter articles, TV, news programs, or something on the internet that contain information about the church that they didn't know. This causes people to dig a little deeper and find out more. This is how it was in my case. Over the years, I had collected many problematic issues to which I had no answer. Instead of trying to resolve them, I put them on the back shelf of my mind. After a couple of decades, I found that I could no longer ignore these questions. My shelf came crashing down, and I needed to find answers. I started my search for truth with the desire to be a defender of the church, to strengthen my faith. I needed to find the honest solutions that I was sure existed. However, as my research progressed, I had to acknowledge that I did not know as much as I thought I did and that this new information I had encountered was more accurate than I originally thought. My excuses started feeling less and less valid, and I was stretching for ways to make the pieces fit. The more I searched, the more elusive the desired answers became, and I was forced to accept that it was my preconceived beliefs that were in error. I have found that when the devout member learns of some of the hidden doctrines in advanced history, they tend to feel deceived or lied to. Because of the church policy of only teaching the faith-promoting things, some feel they have made many of the most important decisions of their lives based on inaccurate or incomplete information. This causes more angst, injury, and loss of faith than do the issues themselves. It does more damage than anything else could and can result in a total loss of faith. People can handle the humanity of their leaders and teachings that evolve as we gain a greater understanding of whatever. What the people I have talked to are most offended by is that is by being deceived with lies and half-truths that paint a picture of what the brethren want us to believe, not what really is. Scott, rather than taking part in this deception by blaming those who have been hurt, you should join those of us who stand for honesty and integrity and expose the deception. The church can evolve into something far greater than it currently is, and your organization should stop trying to defend it at all costs and start helping to transform it.